I have a very difficult task because I am championing the very worst class of a person. Thanks to Charles Dickens, all Victorian people are about cruel and gruel and workhouses. But the, the Industrial Revolution is supposed to consist of people who exploited whole families. And they were kept in near slavery in cold and damp factories so that, they, so that the entrepreneurs could live in beautiful mansions and eat steaks where the people starved. But Francis Carvel was no such person. He did live in a nice house. He lived out at Benvenue. It's out there in the Kilbrony Road in Rostrever. But he contradicts the Dickensian stereotype in every single way. Now, the second obstacle I have who the heck is Francis Carvel? Because nobody ever heard of him. How come there's no streets named after him? How come there's no statues to him in the town if he's that important? Did he really do anything for Newry? Now, there are only a couple of historic relics that exist of, New of Carvel and Newry. And the first one is a substantial headstone type monument that's in St. Mary's graveyard on Chapel Street. If you get a chance, just walk down the path and visit it. Now, the second relic that we have of Carvel is up in Bagnell's Castle. And it's a little uh, poster, an advertising poster. It's looking for people to go on a journey, a not very nice journey during the famine. People were being offered passage on the Lady Caroline that was leaving the port of Warren Point, going to St. John, New Brunswick in Canada, Round about June 1847, the era of coffin ships, another Dickensian stereotype that we all believe in, that everybody was being killed in coffin ships. I am happy and proud on behalf of Newry to state that it has been documented that no passenger ever died on a Carvel ship. And it wasn't that they just had one or two. All his adverts in the papers at the time promised good provisions and water and in some of them a detail of many pounds of meat and all you would have. The Carvels did not sail coffin ships. The booking office was here in the middle of the town, around at Nine Sugar Island, which is nowadays Gordon's chemist shop. But there's no sign of Carvel there. So, since a fortnight ago, we have a new marker of Francis Carvel's existence in the centre of Newry, when the Ulster History Society put up a blue plaque on the front of the Canal Court Hotel. And it was very significant that that was unveiled by John Fisher, whose family carried on the shipping traditions of Carvel. People don't know that, that Fishers came after Carvel. The Fisher family have always revered the name of Carvel in all their family lore. John Fisher can tell you many stories of Carvels. But as I said, he was not typical person of the Industrial Revolution, because here is what the Newry Examiner said about him when he was only 40, 40, 44 years of age. His persevering enterprise has contributed in an eminent degree to the commercial greatness of the prosperous town to which he does honour, and his generous liberality of hand and heart conduces to the comfort of the many who are engaged in the various branches of the great establishment over which he worthily presides. You have never heard that about anybody before or since, or in any other town. Another commentator writing about the, writing in a book called The Picturesque Guide to Carlingford Bay in 1846, a man's 46 by this stage, it said, Francis Carvel of Newry, ever in the van of improvements in that neighbourhood, and then it went on to praise not only him, but the staff that he employed, because they were offering the facilities of their offices and working away on the infrastructure of this town and the region. Ninety years later, in the history column of the New Reporter, it's still going all those years, it's stated that Carvel became the most extensive trader and extensive employer in Newry. That means that all of you sitting down in here who have roots in Newry, it's very likely that your grandparents or great-grandparents worked for Carvels. And they have benefited 
I'm getting the plug in again. His generous liberality of heart and hand. His importance to the economics of Newry is very clear because the reporter article goes on to say, besides his sawmills, his spade factory, he also carried on shipbuilding and he owned several vessels. So this man's getting wider and bigger. But you know, they were only playing it down. I don't know why they had forgotten about it. I'll bring you back to the start, to the first documentary uh, evidence that I was able to find of Francis Carville was in the directory of Newry for 1826. He was only 26 years of age at the time, and he had a simple ironmongery business in uh, Water Street. He was one of seven hardware shops in Water Street and North Street at the time. There's no trace of it remains, of course. At the age of 30, he announced in the local press that he had acquired the extensive Newry Ironworks, which was manufacturing spades and shovels. And by 1840, that factory was sited on Merchant's Quay at the Canal Court. And that's why the Ulster History Circle chose that place for the, for the blue plaque. And at a later date, those spade works were moved down to what we now know as the Buttercream Shopping Centre. And I believe that the spade making was the source of his first wealth, what's called a cash cow, that allowed him to go into his other developments. And the reason that he was so successful there were 65 other spade mills in Ireland at the time. But it's clear that he was an innovator, an inventor of a sort, because within a year of taking over the ironworks, there was newspaper adverts for Carvel's new improved spade. And by the end of the 1840s, in Newry, at the Canal Court site, he was making 800 spades and 1,000 shovels a week. And then you find with little clippings that his spade was being used as far away as Fermoy in County Cork. And by 1850, there was a war in spades, believe it or not. A war of spades. And a crowd in Dublin started to promote the idea that they had got a new improved spade. And what's in the newspapers is that Carvel was publishing a picture of his spade that he had made 20 years earlier, that they were calling the new improved spade. I think what happened was that he built up his, his cash in the spade making early in the 1830s because he began shipping people out and run the shipping line by 1835. I know that because he turns up in the Canadian records claiming taxes and, back and so on back on passengers that he was shipping out there. And then in the mid 1840s he began building ships in Newry. This is totally significant. Building ships on the middle bank I believe it was opposite where the, where the Keys Shopping Centre. And he actually owned about a third of that site where the Keys are. So you see all these bits of ground you put in your mind here, all these things that he owned in around Newry. And he was an influential and powerful man in his 30s because when the Newry Navigation, which became a private company to run the canal, when he, he became a shareholder in it and a director in it. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the Victoria Lock and the Albert Basin were all completed during his t time of ownership. He also uh, petitioned for the bar at the mouth of Carringford Lock to be deepened, you know, so bigger ships could get in. So he pops up in adverts, like in the middle of the famine, he was importing Indian corn. Or if anybody has ever studied the famine has heard the people talking about the yellow meal. So I can tell you that you're here because he brought yellow meal to your grandfathers and fathers and mothers that helped the people in this area sustain themselves through the, through, the, through the famine. And he had a vision that from Newry, he had a vision that uh, the ports of Greenore and Warren Point feeding through Newry would join into the railways and the railways would take us right through to Sligo and then join the Dublin Railway and the Calvin Railway so that Newry would be the port for the middle of Ireland. I wonder if he had lived beyond the age of 54, in 1854, would Belfast ever have got off the ground? <laughs> because he was building ships here. And Belfast didn't get going until the 1850s. Now, I have very short time to tell you the other things about him is that he was a man with a generous liberality of heart and hand. 
and his name is found on the list of the donors to the Unitarian Church over in William Street. He raised funds for Daniel O'Connell's repeal movement. He was the chairman for the relief of Mrs. Mitchell after John Mitchell was exiled. And he was on the committee that brought the Mercy Nuns here. He was a visionary that created transport links that kept us on the map. And he likely employed your great grandfather and helped your ancestors survive the famine by eating the Indian meal. And I reckon he should get top score on all three categories. Michael, thank you. Well done. All good. All good.